I'm proud to announce that today's video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. I've worked with them before and really happy to do again because they have really solid award-winning content, which means thousands of documentaries and shows. Not to mention they have their own exclusive videos. You're not going to find this anyplace else. What's more, it's not just for history buffs. They cover music, technology, nature, food, etc. with new content being added all the time. You can watch Curiosity Stream from your computer, TV, mobile devices, and a host of other platforms. Thus, you can take it anywhere. Prices start for as little as $5 a month. Annual plans are also available. This makes a great gift for anyone who loves to learn. To sweeten the deal, if you click on the link below or scan this QR code and use the code FLASHPOINT, you can save an additional 25%. By doing so, you'll be helping out my show. In fact, because of Curiosity Stream, I was able to add a side trip to Mont Saint Michel to my upcoming hiking tour in Normandy and the D Day beaches. Thus, I'll make a side video on that. To prepare for this trip, I've been binge watching their World War II content, including their latest offering titled The Hunt for the First Nazi Jet. Imagine being an Allied pilot and watching a German jet just blast past you at 100 miles an hour faster than you could possibly go. It must have been insane. So do yourself, and for that matter me, a favor, click on that link below and sign up for some amazing content from Curiosity Stream today. Don't forget my code to save some money. And now, folks, on to the video. It was late August of 1498. Four ships carrying the Portuguese flag made their way up the Malabar coast to western India. They had departed from the city of Calicut just a week prior. In their wake, they had left an enraged king who was bent on bringing them to justice. Pride may have prevented the Portuguese from admitting it, but they were on the run. On August 30th, the commander of the fleet, Vasco da Gama, spotted fast-moving ships inbound from the south. His men began to count them. 10, then 20, then 50, and eventually the count was lost at over 70. The ships carried the elite warriors of the Samudri Raja, the king of Calicut. While the ships were of unique design, one thing alone was certain. This inbound force was hostile. The Portuguese sailors watched on with absolute dread. The intercepting fleet was closing the distance. The winds were simply not favorable for the Europeans. The dawning realization hit everyone. This was not something that they could simply outrun. The only way out for Vasco da Gama and his men would be to engage in an outnumbered fight. The arrival of the Portuguese at Calicut in late May of 1488 was an astonishing sight for the locals. No ship usually sailed this early in the monsoon, and the design of the Portuguese vessels had never been seen before in this part of the world. Four smaller ships were dispatched to bring Vasco da Gama and his men into the port. Mistaking them for being Muslim traders, they were initially brought before a group of Tunisians who ironically spoke Castilian. Thus, Vasco and his men had traveled halfway around the world to speak in a relatively local tongue. The Muslim traders they met were friendly and began to enlighten their European guests on just how complex the world of the Indian Ocean truly was. Roger Crowley in his book The Conquerors puts it really well, quote, The meeting with the friendly Muslims was probably as deeply disorienting as anything that was about to follow. It was as if the Portuguese were looking at their own world down the wrong end of a telescope. It was Europe that was ignorant and isolated, not this sea into which they had stumbled. And they were extremely lucky. One of the Tunisians stated that he would help them interpret this new world. He had a nostalgia for the Portuguese whose ships he had seen trading on the North African coast during the reign of King João II. He offered guidance to the labyrinthine manners and customs of Calicut that would prove invaluable. The city, he told them, was ruled by a powerful king, the Samudri Raja, which meant the Lord of the Sea." End quote. <laughs> 
Calicut was a cosmopolitan port situated on an excellent natural harbor. Ships from all over the Indian Ocean of varying ethnicity and construction would arrive. As long as they paid the all-important harbor tax and stayed somewhat peaceful, no one really became concerned. The people of the city were relatively affluent. The merchants had become rich on trade. This was not a wretched hive of scum and villainy. The city had a respectable Muslim population that had learned to coexist with their Hindu neighbors. And all of this was under the control of the Samudri Raja, the King of Calicut, who went by the name Zamorin. The king had a reputation of being both honorable and fair with traders, making Calicut a major hub in the trading of spice, amongst other things. A delegation was sent in and a meeting was arranged for Vasco de Gama to meet the Samudri. But the captains of the Portuguese fleet immediately protested. Like the de Gama, they had become extremely wary of the Muslim traders nearby and felt that this could be a trap. Despite this, on May 28, 1498, the Portuguese commander along with 13 of his men were brought via a royal procession to meet the king. The scene that now unfolded was one of major contrast. The Portuguese on one end were beleaguered, filthy, downtrodden after their long voyage. Zamorin was seated in splendor, flanked by a gleaming royal entourage. He was surrounded by a shield of large men with long beards and hair, many naked to the waist but adorned in fine clothing and gold earrings. Each of them was carrying a sword, which was now drawn. Much like the Janissary of the Ottomans or the Varangian of the Eastern Romans, these men were elite soldiers. They were members of the Hindu warrior caste, known as the Nayars, and they were sworn to protect their master with their lives. For the Portuguese envoys, they were an imposing and threatening sight. Surprisingly, despite their unique appearance, Vasco and his entourage considered the Samudri Raja and his men to be Christian. Hinduism at this point was something that was entirely unknown to them. Vasco da Gama introduced himself and then launched into his goals of why his king had sent him. That is, finding new trade routes, establishing contact with new kingdoms, and finding Christian sovereigns. However, despite his enthusiasm, the meeting immediately did not go well. Cultural differences and the finesse of good diplomacy was lost on da Gama. In fact, his sense of pride made him extremely cantankerous when he noted that things were going south. Trying to make up for lost ground, da Gama asked for a private meeting with Zamorin and was granted this. When the king asked point blank what he had really come for, Vasco's response was simply that he was in search of Christians and spices. This response failed to impress and their first meeting would end on a low note. That day ended with frustration that arose from the confusion of unfamiliar protocols and the nuances of meeting a new culture. That night, Vasco and his men managed to find lodging nearby. However, a massive crowd turned up to see the new spectacle of the Europeans. The exhausting scene was made worse from the pouring monsoon that drenched the explorers. Undaunted the next day, Vasco da Gama dispatched gifts, 12 pieces of cloth, 4 scarlet hoods, 6 hats, a ring of coral, cases of sugar, honey, and oil to name a few. None of this was worthy of a king, and as a result, the Europeans lost a great deal of credibility with the Samudri, who perhaps at this point was beginning to think of da Gama and his men as nothing more than a bunch of lowly pirates. After getting these gifts, the king made Vasco wait all day before granting another audience. The second meeting would go worse than the first. The king demanded again to know why the Portuguese had come. And if their country was truly rich, why did they not bring what was truly valued, that is, gold? Da Gama knew he was cornered and responded that this was simply a voyage of discovery and that next time, richer gifts would come. This second meeting would end miserably. Vasco da Gama would never meet the Samudri in person again. A standoff between the two had begun and would only intensify. <laughs> 
It was, after all, the uncertainty of the motives of either side that would push Vasco and Zamorin to near paranoia, Roger Crowley expertly explains, quote, The Samudre probably remained uncertain how to play these strange visitors. They fitted no known category of merchant, yet they evidently came from a great king. And the commercially oriented monarch, whose wealth derived from the trading vessels that came to his open port, was reluctant to snob a potential opportunity out of hand. At his shoulder, the Muslim merchants were undoubtedly hostile to these infidel intruders. Their significant antagonism, which the King of Calicut quickly deduced, was perhaps as much commercial as it was religious. And perhaps the Muslim opposition was justified. The Portuguese, after all, had come to the Indian Ocean hardened by decades of holy war in North Africa. Their default strategy was suspicion, aggression, the half-drawn sword, and a simple binary choice between Christian and Muslim, which perhaps he could play to his own favor." End quote. Despite the poor status of negotiations, the Portuguese were tolerated and were allowed to trade in the city. Vasco and his men stayed in Calicut for several weeks. In this way, chests of spices were purchased. But more importantly, this time allowed for their inquisitive minds to go into overdrive. This time that they spent in the city allowed them to take in a vast amount of information about trade routes, major cities, prevailing winds, about the monsoons. They learned how spice flowed not just from India, but from the islands of Sumatra, Java, and even further east. They noted the inefficiencies that carried these valuable goods to the Red Sea and then across the Mediterranean to Venice and Genoa. They saw that every time spice would trade hands, the price would go up and the risks of transportation would intensify. Thus, it didn't take long for the Portuguese to deduce the points of weakness. They started to formulate how this complex trade could be disrupted, manipulated, and taken advantage of. By mid-August, Vasco da Gama knew it was time to leave. July and August had been relatively low periods for trade, but in the weeks to follow, the winds would change and Muslim traders would be inbound. Already, he sensed the growing hostility of the local Muslims, who he feared were poisoning the mind of the Samudri against him. The Portuguese commander could tell that his prior aggressive exploits along the African coast against Muslim cities had caught up with him. Thus, Vasco da Gama dispatched Diogo Diaz, the brother of Bartholomew Diaz, along with a majority of their trading goods to reach out to the King of Calicut to see if he was agreeable to allow the Portuguese to leave a permanent trading outpost. That request was denied. Instead, Zamorin had Diogo Diaz placed under house arrest and his goods confiscated. From the Samudri's perspective, this was a calculated move done to make sure that Vasco da Gama would not simply sail off and would abide by the king's law that all incoming ships pay the port tax. In Vasco's mind, however, this was an act of war. The Portuguese commander would no doubt retaliate. On August 19th, a trading delegation of the citizens of Calicut were welcomed aboard Vasco's flagship, the Sao Gabriel, a group of merchants came, six of which were of high caste, that is, valuable. During the night, Vasco made his move. He had his men seize 18 prisoners, then raised his anchor and sailed away. A letter was sent to Zamorin stating that the Gama would return, open fire on the city, and decapitate the prisoners in the harbor for all to see. That is, if Diogo Diaz's men and the Portuguese goods were not returned. The King of Calicut agreed, even going so far as to allow for a padrão to be constructed in the city. On August 23rd, the prisoner exchange occurred. Several ships approached the Portuguese fleet while it was in harbor. Diogo and his men were exchanged for some of the Hindu prisoners. Then, even more ships approached, bringing in the Portuguese goods. But right then and there, Vasco da Gama changed his mind. Perhaps he could no longer control his paranoia. Or perhaps he surmised that these incoming ships were a threat. The Portuguese commander decided to break the deal, abandon his goods, and abscond with his remaining prisoners. He opted not to pay the port tax on the way out. By the time the Samudri Raja found out about this, the Portuguese fleet was well underway. 
Zamorin was enraged and rightfully wanted retribution. Meanwhile, Vasco had sailed north along the Malabar coast, but on August 30th, their ships were intercepted by a fleet of over 70 vessels sent by the Samudri to hunt them down. While the Portuguese may have had the advantage in firepower, the warriors of Calicut greatly outnumbered them in terms of ships and men. The smaller ships swarmed around da Gama's fleet. Despite the barrage that was unleashed by the Portuguese cannons, the Samudri's men continued to advance. For several bloody hours, an ongoing fight ensued between the two fleets. Many of the Portuguese were wounded, some of them were killed, and yet the king's men pushed the offensive. For a brief moment, the Nayars of Calicut had the advantage, and events began to look very bleak for Vasco da Gama and his men. Many felt that this was the end. Suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, a thunderstorm descended on the battle. Vasco had his men open their sails and took advantage of what for him must have been nothing less than a divine wind. Bearing was set for due west, and the ships of Portugal flung themselves out into the open ocean, where the Calicut fleet could not follow. History would record this as the first Portuguese naval battle of the Indian Ocean. It would not be the last. Eventually, Vasco returned to the relative safety of the coast and took anchor at Anjadiva Island. On September 15th, a padrão was raised here, but this was not a safe place. On September 22nd, a second fleet sent by the Samudri attacked, but it was smaller and was driven off with cannon fire. Soon afterwards, a stranger approached the fleet. He was well-dressed, spoke with a Venetian dialect, and stated that he came bearing gifts. He invited Vasco da Gama to meet his master, who he simply described as a rich lord. But Paolo da Gama, Vasco's brother, began to investigate him with the locals. The natives of the area said that this man was a pirate. The Venetian stranger was immediately seized and under torture revealed the truth. He revealed that he was a Polish Jew who had fled to India to escape the pogroms of Europe. There he had become a servant of the Sultan of Goa, and he stated that his master had dispatched a fleet to capture the Portuguese. Roger Crowley explains the implications, quote, The Venetian admitted that there was a growing number of ships gathering to attack. The Sultan of Goa wanted to assess whether the Portuguese ships could be taken with the eventual aim of employing the Portuguese in his wars against his neighbors. For Vasco da Gama, this shed an interesting light on the politics of Western India, which would later be employed to advantage, and it would also flag the importance of Goa." End quote. The situation had now become critical as the forces of Calicut were inbound from the south and the Sultan of Goa was coming in from the north. What's more, the island of Anjadiva was a place to restock water, thus implying that Arab merchants from the Islamic world would soon be appearing. It was definitively time to get out. On October 5th, the fleet turned west into the vast expanse of the Indian Ocean. It was their only choice. The Venetian stranger was brought along. In time, he'd be baptized and named Gaspar da Gama. His political knowledge would prove invaluable. However, with the poor timing of the monsoons, the trip back across the Indian Ocean would prove to be a disaster. In the book, The Conquerors, this is well described. Quote, The return across the Indian Ocean descended into nightmare. It was a sea of dispiriting and contrary breezes pushing them back. Then the far more terrible calms with the ships sitting unmoving for days. Men bickering over whatever shade was afforded by the dejected sails. They were tortured by thirst and hunger, calling on the saints for aid, vermin crawling from the biscuits, the water afouled. Then the dreaded symptoms of scurvy reappeared. One by one, the dead were lowered over the sides with a soft splash and the murmuring of prayers. Those that were left alive were just tottering. A mutiny was in the making. Then, as despair reached its zenith, a favorable wind picked up and carried them west for six days. On January 2nd, 1499, the battered ships spotted the African coast. 
It had taken 23 days to make the voyage across. The return took 93. The lessons of the seasonal monsoon were extremely hard won. End quote. They had arrived near the Muslim port of Mogadishu in modern-day Somalia. They didn't stop, but they did manage to shell the city as they passed. On January 7th, they arrived at Malindi to exchange gifts with the local sultan and then moved on. Hostel Mombasa was avoided entirely on January 13th. However, as they made their way south, the loss of life on the Indian Ocean became very apparent. There simply wasn't enough sailors for the entire fleet. The Sao Rafael was beached and then burned. The remaining three ships continued the journey. At Zanzibar, peaceful negotiations were made with the Sultan. It wasn't until March 3rd that the fleet took anchor at St. Bras. Here, the supply ship was too unfit to continue. By March 20th, 1499, the Cape of Good Hope was rounded and Vasco now turned north, away from the cold. From this point onward, the record of the voyage became very hazy. There is one account that by April 25th, the fleet had reached the Gambia, at which point a storm separated the remaining two ships. The Berio would arrive back at Lisbon on July 10th, 1499, the Sao Gabriel a few days afterwards. Vasco da Gama was not on board. His brother Paulo had become very sick on the last leg, and Vasco would accompany him to the Azores, where Paulo died. Vasco would eventually return to Portugal in late August, where he would mourn his brother's death at the chapel Santa Maria de Belim. It wasn't until early September that he made his glorious entry into the capital. King Manuel was ecstatic with the success and gave da Gama grants of money, land, and title. The spices that he brought back sold for a fortune and his exploits were quickly made known to the rest of Europe. Even the Borgia Pope, Alexander VI, was impressed. A sea passage to India had been found. But not all were happy. The King of Calicut was still seething. The Sultans of East Africa were enraged. And on the other side of Europe, alarm bells were ringing in Venice. Their monopoly on spice had been jeopardized. Roger Crowley brings us to light. Quote, Vasco da Gama's voyage had taken everyone by surprise. It had added 1,800 new places to the map and revealed a mine of new information about the Indies. It would compel all interested parties across the vast stretch of the earth, Christian, Muslim, and Hindu, to make fresh strategic calculations. And this became readily apparent. Even before Vasco da Gama's return, King Manuel had been laying down keels for the next departure. By the same token, he had ordered the suppression of all the sailing charts of Gamma's voyage on pain of death. Knowledge was wealth and power. End quote. A new expedition had already been planned. Whereas Vasco de Gama had traveled with four small ships to explore, what now left Lisbon was not a fleet. It was an armada.